I think that the one place where instructors do have control and is in their classroom, really, in most institutions, as far as I know, that's still the case. And so you may not have much control or any control anywhere else but your classroom. My recommendation is really just to encourage questions, like just questions. And it's a give students the space and give yourself the space to ask questions and to distance yourself from arguments. Alana Redstone with us on Heterodox Out Loud. Today's episode is about how voices become silenced and when to determine if a free speech crisis exists. I'm Zach Rausch. Our episode, What the Free Speech Debate is Still Missing. There are many ways for speech to be restricted. We'll hear the story of Alana Redstone, a professor who discusses how we think about the nature of free speech on campus. She argues that we must go beyond the surface and look at subtle forms of censorship and suppression that exist within higher education. Our topics include free speech, the COVID-19 pandemic, and bias in the classroom. Before our interview, Alana's blog, What the Free Speech Debate is Still Missing. The narrator is Stina Nielsen. What the Free Speech Debate is Still Missing. Ilana Redstone, May 25th, 2019. The question of, is there a campus free speech crisis, is fraught. The answer depends in large part on the evidence one uses to answer it. In most commentary so far, the metrics used to measure political tolerance on campus are at best incomplete, and at worst, misleading. Our collective attention is drawn to overt rather than latent manifestations of illiberalism. It is not surprising that dramatic phenomena like campus mobs and shoutdowns get most of the attention. But less overt forms of bias are equally problematic, yet under-addressed. When we focus solely on what we can measure and count, disinvitations, faculty terminations, or red-light ratings, for example, we shine a narrow spotlight on a much larger problem. Consider two posts by political scientist Jeffrey Sachs, entitled, There is no Campus Free Speech Crisis, and The Campus Free Speech Crisis Ended Last Year. Sachs argues that controversy over the campus free speech crisis was overblown, and that in any case, the putative crisis dissipated over the course of 2018. In his first piece, he reinforces the argument made by other commentators, including Matt Iglesias at Vox and Aaron Hanlon at NBC, that young people and university students generally support free speech, higher education is associated with more tolerance for offensive speech, and a few unrepresentative mobs and shutdowns shouldn't set the terms of how we talk about free speech on campus. In his second piece, he argues that, at any rate, the number of problematic cases as measured by these metrics declined during 2018. Sachs acknowledges a couple of caveats. For instance, a decline in disinvitations might actually be the result of students no longer wanting to take the risk of inviting controversial speakers. Yet his analyses of the climate on campus and others like them fail to account for two significant factors. One, the limited way in which many people on campus, faculty and students alike, conceptualize free speech. Two, the way that potentially controversial material is taught in the classroom. Conditional support for free speech. The loudest voices in any contentious issue tend to fall clearly into the for or against column. As far as issues surrounding free speech and viewpoint diversity are concerned, in this view, there are essentially two sides. There are conventional supporters, a group that includes me, who consider the dual ideals of free speech and viewpoint diversity to be of paramount importance on campus and off. They tend to understand variability in how we see and relate to the world as essential for learning and growth. They support pluralism and the free exchange of ideas, even when it seems inconvenient, uncomfortable, 
noxious or threatening to do so. On the other side are the cynics. While they tend to see free speech and viewpoint diversity as worthy ideals in the abstract, in practice, they are perceived as often doing more harm than good. For instance, they allow false or dangerous views to persist or grow. To their minds, advocacy for viewpoint diversity or free speech often seems like a thinly veiled attempt to normalize white supremacy and other harmful ideologies. Consequently, they often position themselves in opposition to those who appeal to these ideals. In spite of the lure of this simplistic dichotomy, however, there is a third category that we might think of as conditional supporters of free speech and viewpoint diversity. It consists of those who view themselves as supportive, yet who consider their own worldview to be beyond meaningful reproach. As a result, they tend to lack sufficient intellectual humility, charity, or curiosity to benefit from diverse viewpoints or engage constructively across difference. Instead, they appeal to viewpoint diversity or open inquiry when convenient for advancing their own agenda but often try to stifle perspectives that run contrary thereto. In some ways, this third group is more dangerous to efforts to promote viewpoint diversity than its more direct opponents. More alarming still, this category is made up in no small part of students and young people. This may help explain the disconnect between studies showing that people ages 18 to 34 are among the most likely to support free speech in the abstract, with those showing that students seem significantly more likely than most others to self-censor in practice. The conditional supporters were on full display at the recent conference in Washington, D.C., put on by the University of California's National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement, created in October 2017 in the aftermath of a series of national protests, including several on University of California campuses that raised serious free speech concerns. In addition to bringing together a range of people working on related topics, one of the center's goals is to provide a hub for activities and events aimed at restoring trust in the value and importance of free speech. I was fortunate enough to be a participant on one of the panels. Given the subject of the conference, I assumed that most of the other attendees would be supporters of free speech in the conventional sense that I understand it. And yet, over the course of the afternoon, it became clear that many of those present had a significantly different understanding of what free speech entails and doesn't. A key example occurred during the discussion for the panel in which I participated, Furthering Civil Discourse in Higher Education. One of the questions posed by the moderator was whether the idea of civility can reinforce the status quo and work to marginalize views of groups that have been underrepresented. One of my fellow panelists answered definitively, yes, elaborating with a metaphor. Think about if you are trying to get the attention of someone who's, you know, handing out life vests, right? And the person the furthest away from whoever's handing out life vests in an emergency has to jump up and down and scream, give me the life vest, right? And the person very, very close to whoever's handing out the life vests can be like, pardon me, I would very much like not to drown today. And the chances are, The cheapest seats are the ones furthest from the guy with the life vest. This drew an enthusiastic response from the audience, with one student singling it out to thank her in the Q&A. The panelists' remarks reflect a perspective that society can be reduced to a power struggle between identity groups. It's not news that this perspective dominates on the political left. However, Hearing it evoked and received uncritically at a conference on promoting free speech was unexpected. If ostensible supporters of viewpoint diversity and the free exchange of ideas 
are apparently non-reflective about their own worldviews and readily portray complex social phenomenon in Manichaean terms, improvements to the prevailing civic and intellectual dynamics on campus and beyond will likely continue to prove elusive. Bias in the classroom. In many courses on campus, material is regularly presented in such a way that theoretical perspectives are taught as definitive truth, and the narrow range of causes and solutions offered for our most difficult societal problems are presented as the only morally valid way to understand and relate to the world. Consider the following example. In March 2019, Aurora University undergraduate Kevin Weiss wrote a commentary for the Chicago Tribune with the headline, A College Lecture Made Me Realize I'm Squelching Free Speech on Campus. He described how, in a class discussion on the proposed removal of Confederate statues from public spaces, virtually all of the students who spoke up in the approximately 75-person class were the most left-wing. They strongly favored removing not only Confederate statues, but also monuments to nameless Confederate soldiers erected for the families who lost loved ones, and even the Washington Monument and Jefferson Memorial. And yet, at an after-class meeting, he realized that there were many students who supported more nuanced solutions, such as keeping some statues up to be used as learning tools, preserving others in museums, or removing the statues of notorious Confederate commanders while allowing monuments to nameless soldiers to remain. When it comes to free speech on campus, he concluded, I am part of the problem. I could have spoken up during the lecture, but I chose not to. I let the more radical voices rule the day, uncontested. When students are actively led or passively allowed by instructors to believe that there is only one right way to understand the world, the groundwork is laid for a breakdown in communication. In Weiss's example, the students who were not present at the smaller after-class meeting likely came away from the lecture with the impression that the only acceptable approach to the problem was that of the most vocal students, raising all the monuments. During the spring 2019 semester, I taught a course on viewpoint diversity called Bigots and Snowflakes, Living in a World Where Everyone Else is Wrong. Over the course of the semester, I had the opportunity to hear from several students about their experiences in other classes. Several mentioned courses in which the topic of intersectionality arose, and were struck that at no point did the instructor mention that it is a theory and a possible way to see the world, not truth in any universal sense. I have heard similar stories from students regarding how critical race theory is typically taught, despite instructors often explicitly proclaiming from the outset that they leave their personal political biases at the door. To be clear, these viewpoints and theories should be taught. They constitute important and valid perspectives. Even those who do not see their value should appreciate that exiling them would be an authoritarian solution and would simply imperil learning in a different direction. The problem is that much of what is taught in the classroom is currently not presented with adequate context or alongside charitably presented competing theories. As I put it in a recent essay, Students can and do go through entire courses, and indeed, through their entire undergraduate, and in some cases, graduate education, never encountering the possibility that there can be valid reasons to think differently about how to approach social problems. While students who become aware of this lacuna can and should express their frustration, The obligation to provide context ultimately should rest upon instructors, who, as professionals, bear the lion's share of the responsibility. Instructors, myself included, who touch on politically sensitive subjects, 
have a moral and intellectual obligation to portray the world in a fair-minded way. Although that obligation should be taken as seriously as any other, it continues to go largely unfulfilled. In sum, the dual problems of implicitly conditional support for free speech and viewpoint diversity and subtle but pervasive bias in the way material is taught in the classroom suggest we need a much wider spotlight in our consideration of campus climate and intellectual freedom. Stina Nielsen reading Ilana Redstone's blog, What the Free Speech Debate is Still Missing. Ilana joins us now. Alana, thanks so much for coming on to Heterodox Out Loud. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Can you tell me how you ended up becoming passionate around these issues of free speech and viewpoint diversity? Sure. I guess I would. there's sort of a two-part answer. One is that I don't think there was a specific singular moment. I think it was a series of observations over time about the nature of the conversation that we were having both with students and in sort of the discourse more broadly about sensitive and controversial topics. My interest in free speech and free expression is sort of a downstream interest from my primary interest, which is really how we think and communicate with each other about these topics and the assumptions that we make and the beliefs that we hold dear and our ability or inability, as the case may be, to challenge those things and the issues that surround free speech and free expression and disinvitations and shutdown, I see those as being the important yet also downstream effects of sort of a bigger problem. In the blog, you talk about these different positions on free speech, and you you note that you're a conventional supporter of free speech. And can you first just explain again what you mean by this? Yeah, it's interesting. So it was a couple of years ago. I went back and I read that now, and I know I I use that language. I wrote that coming off of this conference at the UC Center and just having the experience of going into this thinking that there was a shared set of values or principles that oriented people who were had self-selected to be part of this conference, at least with respect to those particular topics of free speech and viewpoint diversity and whatever. And I was very surprised that that didn't seem to be the case. And it seemed problematic to me and worth pointing to. Most people don't say they're against free speech. Most people don't say they're against viewpoint diversity or they think that's a bad idea or no, we need fewer perspectives, right? It's always this sort of, well, but, 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 but about, you know, but that's, but that position, you know, has this effect or has this harmful effect or the other harmful effect. And so I don't always think that we do a good job of really thinking through the costs of those limitations, both inside academia and outside. So, Alana, where do you see most threats to free speech coming from? The threats to free speech, Kathy Young had an interesting article. I think it was around the time when Nicole Hannah-Jones got, when she was going through the whole ten, the tenure thing at UNC Chapel Hill. She said, when they come from the right, they're coming from outside of academia to individuals in academia. And when they come from the left, they're largely coming from within academia, which I think is a fairly accurate description. And which one is a greater threat? I mean, neither is good. I guess I'm not sure. I think it just depends on what you're looking at. I mean, I think that in the day-to-day sort of how we talk about things, I think that there are more problems that probably that come from an ide- a sense of ideological conformity that exists within academia. But nobody wins anything by, you know, death threats coming from the right either. Like, that doesn't help anybody. So I guess it just depends on what you're looking at. Right. Definitely not a competition. (laughs) No, it's not a competition. I mean, we can all win and lose and whatever. You did write this piece in 2019. How has COVID and other major political events changed issues around free speech and academic freedom within higher ed? There's sort of the short-term effects of COVID and then the long-term effects of COVID and then summer of 2020 and George Floyd and everything else. And so I think in the beginning of COVID, I remember the conversation was a little bit like, does anybody really, really care anymore about you know free speech and viewpoint? Like, who cares? Like, no one's on campus. We're all in our we're all shut in our houses. And you know, the end of May, and then George Floyd happens, and everything that followed that, and it was like, oh yeah, actually, this stuff was may have laid dormant for a little while, but 
it's all very much still there. And so I think COVID had this effect of really just exacerbating existing divisions. Like, I don't think everything was, I mean, not that anyone is making this argument, but it's certainly not the case that things were going along fine until we were just struck by lightning by COVID. What do you think the role of virtual education plays into this? It's an interesting question. And I, you know, I spent the, obviously the end of the spring of the 2020 and then all of the next year teaching on Zoom. And on the one hand, I think you lose a lot by not being able to read nonverbal cues particularly well. I mean, yes, you're seeing people, a lot of students keep their cameras off. And even when they're on, like, it's not the same thing as sort of being able to, well, I said this thing and did that person raise their eyebrow at me or, you know, or whatever, like you can't read any of those cues. So I think that is a real disadvantage. You know, I think the advantage can be that, you know, I think that sometimes there are students who feel comfortable speaking and engaging on Zoom that may not feel comfortable in a classroom setting. And so I, you know, but you can't really fully run that counterfactual, but are there more students or a different mix of students that participate in an online setting than in a live setting? Maybe. I guess where I land is I would prefer the in-person teaching. As much as I love the convenience of being able to teach in my pajamas, I prefer the in-person teaching. You've written about five different essays for us over the past couple of years. Is there a thread of your writing that ties your pieces together? My position is really, and this for better or for worse, has really been about how can we have a better conversation? Sort of take whatever position that you want on anything, but let's try and have a better conversation about it. And let's be honest about what the costs are of drawing sort of the lines in different places and drawing the rules in different ways and think that through and sort of just really trying to get people to question some of the assumptions that they make and how we think about these things. So I guess that would be the best answer I could give. What advice would you give to professors who are looking to increase the amount of viewpoint diversity in their classes and to students as well? I think that the one place where instructors do have control and is in their classroom, really, in most institutions, as far as I know, that's still the case. And so you may not have much control or any control anywhere else but your classroom. My recommendation is really just to encourage questions, like just questions. And it's a give students the space and give yourself the space to ask questions and to distance yourself from arguments, like literally give them the language to say, okay, someone might think, or you're asking the question, what might someone think about this? Or what could somebody say? Or what would, do you think that everybody agrees? Do you think there's consensus on that point? Like give people the distance. It's the vulnerability that you're trying to minimize both for yourself and for the students. And part of that vulnerability can be reduced by giving them language to create distance. And so that I think is helpful for students. I think I don't know how much how many students are listening to the podcast, but like you can do that on your own, right? Like you can say like, well, what would someone else say? What would somebody say who thinks differently? Or what would a whatever person s- sitting here say? You know, a Trump voter, or what would they, what would, you know, and right. So try again, like, so you can, or even language, like I'm channeling an argument. I mean, it's a little bit sort of fruity language, but like, you know, just to give that distance that will minimize the vulnerability. I think those are easy and free things that people can do. Alana Redstone on Heterodox Out Loud. You can learn more about free speech on campus on our website at heterodoxacademy.org slash open dash inquiry. Before you go, remember to subscribe and download us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Davies Content produced this show. I'm Zach Rausch. See you next time.